Hello, today we're going to review for the AP exam by doing some practice problems from Unit 1. Remember that Unit 1 has both um, the mole concept and atomic structure in it. So here's an example um, from an old AP exam. This is a free response question. Uh, so we have a complete photoelectron spectrum of an unknown element. Um, so sometimes this is abbreviated PES, photoelectron spectrum. And it says draw an X above the peak that corresponds to the orbital with electrons that are, that are on average closest to the nucleus and justify your answer in terms of Coulomb's law. Um, so please make sure if it asks you to annotate a graph like this, you follow the directions exactly. And um, the photoelectron spectrum will show where the electrons are in terms of their energy levels and orbitals. So the way that I approach these problems is whichever peak has the highest binding energy is the closest to the nucleus. So that's going to be 1s. Um, and then you would, the next one is 2s, 2p, and 3s. Um, that explains why this peak is so much bigger, because p can hold six total electrons, s can only hold two. And um, for this one in particular, it looks like we have 1, 2, 3, 4, um, plus 6 is 10, plus just 1 in the 3s, so that's 11 electrons total. Um, so it's probably going to be a neutral atom of sodium, or it could be an ion of a different element. Okay, so now that we've kind of figured that out, it wants us to draw an x above the peak that corresponds to the electrons that are closest to the nucleus. So I'm going to relabel this one as x closest to the nucleus, and it says just to your answer in terms of Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law has two parts to it. Um, so the attractions are going to be stronger between two things. Whenever you have um, a larger charge or a smaller distance or radius. So the closer things are together, the stronger their attraction. So this one has very strong attractions because it has a very large binding energy. And the reason for that really large binding energy is because it's so close to the nucleus, it is being held on there very tightly due to that decreased distance. So A was worth two points. Um, one point for getting the correct peak and putting an X above it on the graph. And then the second point was for that justification. Um, so you have a smaller distance leading to a greater binding energy because of the stronger Coulombic attractions. Um, for part B, based on the spectrum, write the complete electron configuration. Uh, we've already kind of done that, uh, but let's go ahead and write it out in, in uh, really proper notation. So you would write 1s2, 2s2, through uh, 2p, excuse me, 2p6, and then 3s1. And so that would show those 11 electrons. And now for part C, oh, B was just one point, um, but for part C, draw a peak corresponding to the valence electrons of an element that has one more proton than the unknown element has. Okay, so if this unknown element is sodium, so 11 electrons, if it has one more proton, it must be magnesium. So we'll have 12 protons. Uh, and it says draw a peak corresponding to the valence electron that has one more proton. So I'm just going to make some space here. It still has the same number of, um, the same valence orbital. It's still going to be in that 3s, but it will have two electrons in its 3s. And um, the additional protons increases the charge due to Coulomb's law. Um, so it will have a slightly higher binding energy than sodium's valence electrons. So you will see like this. And so um, you would actually draw that into the graph. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It needs to be larger than 2p, but smaller than that uh, original 3s. So and it needs to go all the way up to the same height as the 2s. And there you go. Okay, so that last example was um, a short free response question. It was only four points total. Uh, this one is an example from a long free response question. Long free response questions are 10 points total. Now, um, 
In this one, we have a, we're going to determine the iodine content of tablets that contain potassium iodide and an inert water-soluble sugar as a filler. And then, so you dissolve the tablet in 50 milliliters of water, and you use an excess of 0.2 molar lead-2 nitrates added. Yellow precipitate forms, uh, which is then filtered, washed, and dried. Okay, so this first part of the question is more based on unit four. Um, I'm going to go ahead and answer it because uh, it leads into the following questions, but just kind of know that it's not part of unit one. And it is very common for them to mix up the units in a single question. Okay, so the potassium iodide is going to react with the uh, lead to nitrate to form lead to iodide and um, to potassium nitrate. And so if I balance, it's like that. Um, but that's not a net ionic equation. Net ionic, we need to remove any spectator ions. So the lead to iodide is a solid product. So our net ionic will be the two aqueous iodides react with the lead two ions to form that solid lead two iodide. Um, the potassium and the nitrate ions are completely soluble. Um, so those are spectator ions. Um, and it says, explain why the reaction is best represented by a net ionic equation. It's because the potassium and the nitrate aren't changing over the course of the reaction, so you don't need to include them. Um, so they don't really do anything. They're still there, but they don't do anything for the reaction. And both of those, I and II, were both one point each. Okay, so now we're looking at our data table a little bit more closely. Uh, explain the purpose of drying and weighing the filter paper with the precipitate three times. So first drying, second drying, third drying. The point of that is to make sure that all of the water has evaporated. Um, so you know, let me write our net ionic equation again so we can see it. We have our iodide and our lead two ions forming lead two iodine. You need to then filter out this solid product, and um, it will have some water on it. So you need to dry out all the water so that way you know your final mass is just that lead to iodide. So, and this was just one point, uh, and that was to make sure that all of the water has evaporated. And then it says in the filtrate solution. So that means um, if you have your, you know, filter paper and funnel like this, and it's collecting in some kind of container. When you filter through and you're collecting the lead to iodide on the top, that's your precipitate. But what goes through the filter um, is called the filtrate. So in the filtrate solution is the potassium ion concentration greater than, less than, or equal to the nitrate concentration and justify your answer. Well, both of those ions are completely soluble, so they will be floating through the solution, but you're going to have a greater um, concentration of nitrate. So always try to answer the question how it's written. Potassium ion concentration is less than the nitrate ion concentration. You used excess lead to nitrate to make sure that it completely reacted with all of the potassium iodide, all of the Ki that was in the tablet. Okay, So you used excess of this stuff so you're going to end up with a greater concentration of nitrate ions at the end. Um, you're also going to wind up with some excess lead ions passing through into your filtrate solution. Um, and that was just one point as well. For part D, it says to calculate the number of moles of precipitate that is produced in the experiment. Um, so again, this is like a really solid unit one question. Um, you wanted to take the Final mass there, the 1.698 grams, and that's filter paper plus the precipitate. You want to subtract out the filter paper, 1.462, and that will give you just the mass of the precipitate, which is 0 0.236 grams. And our precipitate is the uh, lead to iodide. To convert that to moles, you need to use the molar mass of lead to iodide, which is uh, 461 grams per mole. And once you divide uh, the 0 0.236 divided by 461, uh, you get that there were 5.12 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of the lead to iodide. 
Uh, so I'm making sure that I'm using the three sig figs because when you subtract, you have uh, three decimal places when you're subtracting three decimal places. And so that gives us three significant digits in our final answer. And that one was just one point. Um, let me switch colors so we can see. Do the last question here. Calculate the mass percent of iodine in the tablet. Um, so if I have that many moles of lead to iodide, uh, 5.12 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of the lead to iodide. There are two iodines present for every one of the lead to iodides. Okay. So I need to multiply the moles by two to get the number of just iodine. Then I need to go ahead and convert that back to grams of just iodine. And I'm going to use the molar mass for that. So the 126.9 grams per mole for iodine. And that will give me the mass of just the iodine present in that precipitate. Um, so times 2 times 126.9 and 3 sig figs, 130 grams of iodine. Then I can just divide by the original uh, mass of the tablet, which was 0.425, and times 100 to give me the mass percent. Um, and I get 30.6% iodide. Um, and that one was two points for E, one point for getting the correct grams of iodine and one point for getting the correct percent by mass. This is a really good example of where if you get part D wrong, you can still get the points for part E. Just make sure you're showing your work and showing how you're using that one correctly. Um, you could also get partial credit for part E with that same um, logic. Now remember I said this was a, a long free response question. Um, so this is the rest of it. Um, it's very common that these questions will go to F, G, or H with the number of parts. Now, um, so in another trial, the student dissolves a tablet in 55 milliliters of water instead of 50 milliliters of water. Uh, predict whether the experimentally determined mass percent will be greater than less than or equal to and justify our answer. This is a very um, typical lab type of question. Um, the experimentally determined mass percent should be equal, all right? Should be equal because when you're doing, this is called a gravimetric analysis lab, but when you're, you're, you're reacting to things and you're filter, filtering out a precipitate, the water has to be dried out of the precipitate. So it doesn't really matter how much water you add in the beginning for this type of reaction because you're going to then just dry it back out. So with this particular, quote, error, it's not even really an error, it doesn't affect the mass of um, iodide. That one was just one point. Um, for G, G is not um, really a unit one question at all. It has more to do with unit seven, which is KSP. Um, I'm going to um, go over it really quick, but you feel free to you know skip forward and look at more of the unit one multiple choice questions. Um, so a student in another lab wants to determine the iodide content, but does not have access to lead to nitrate. The student does have access to silver nitrate. Um, which reacts to produce silver iodide. And the KSP for silver iodide is 8.5 to the 10 to the negative 17. And it says, will the substitution of silver nitrate result in the precipitation of iodine from the solution? And then justify your answer. So because um, the value for KSP here is so low, we don't even need to do any calculations. We know that because the KSP is very, very small, that means the Silver iodide, it will definitely precipitate. So you would say, yes, it will precipitate. Um, and your justification is as simple as um, because the silver iodide is insoluble, so it will form a uh, precipitate from that uh, based on that very, very small value for KSP. Uh, and that was one point in part III. The student only has access to one potassium iodide tablet and the balance can measure to the nearest 0 0.01 gram. Will the student be able to determine the mass of silver iodide produced to three significant figures? And um, the answer there is no, because if you have um, a balance that only measures to the hundredth place, and my original mass of the tablet was uh, 0.425 grams, okay, so even on this balance, we can only measure to the hundredths place. So 
at best you'll get like 4.42 or 0.43 on that balance and that only is two significant digits. So you'd say no, the student will not be able to determine the mass to three significant figures because it is limited by the hundredths place of the balance. Um, you can only get to the two significant digits. And that was just one point. Okay, so let's look at some multiple choice questions that go along with unit one. Um, you will always see multiple choice questions with A, B, C, D parts, not E, but the exam used to have some, um, used to have five answer choices instead of four, so you'll see some of these questions, or some of those older questions, they're still good chemistry questions. Um, so when we have hafnium metal, it's heated, and the product of the reaction is found to contain 62.2% hafnium by mass and 37.4% chlorine by mass, what is the empirical formula? Um, so the easiest way to do these questions uh, will be to pretend the percents are grams. Hafnium, chlorine, and go ahead and change the grams to moles using their molar masses. All right. So we have uh, 0 0.348 moles for the hafnium and uh, 1.05 moles for the chlorine. Once you get there, you'll divide by the smallest one, 0.348 for both. And so I get a 1 to 3 ratio there, so your formula will be HFCl3. Um, so your answer is C. Now, your another approach to this would be to just find the mass percent for each of these options and see which one fits. So if you don't remember how to do empirical formula, although you should, um, you can just do the mass percent based on the, the molar masses and um, check your answers that way. Okay, so here's another example of an empirical formula question, but this one they already give you moles, which is great. Um, so all you need to do is divide by the smallest one, which is 0.55. And so I get one for the tellurium, uh, two for the potassium, and uh, three for the oxygen, so K2TEO3. Uh, very straightforward question. Okay, so here's an example of a multiple choice question from the uh, atomic structure part. Um, think of you an electron configuration, and which is the following species could that correspond to? You can count the electrons. So we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 12, 18. So 18 total electrons. Neutral oxygen will have 16 electrons. Uh, neutral neon will have, uh, I'm sorry, not 16. <laughs> oxygen will have 8 electrons. I was looking at its mass. Neon has uh, 10 electrons, potassium ions. So potassium normally has 19, but when it has a plus one ion, it will form uh, those 18 electrons. So that is that one. Um, chlorine normally has 17, and they're trying to throw you off with this positive sign. So since it normally has 17, that will have a 16 electron, uh, which is not correct. So it's C there.